1842, Luigi Federico Menabrea published his notes on Charles Babbage's analytical engine, observing that the machine can be brought into play so as to give several results at the same time. His work, part of a remarkable life that later included becoming Prime Minister of Italy, laid the conceptual groundwork for parallel computing. This video will focus on task parallel computing, and in particular, on algorithms that are designed to distribute tasks across processors. We'll look at relevant historical trends, how parallel algorithms can be analysed and how they can be implemented. To understand the growing importance of parallel computing, it's useful to be aware of some key historical trends. In 1965, Gordon Moore, working at the time at Fairchild Semiconductor, wrote a legendary article entitled Cramming More Components Onto Integrated Circuits in which he made a startling projection that the number of components on an integrated circuit produced at minimum cost would double every year for the next decade. Note that it's not just a statement about transistor numbers, it's also a commercial estimate. Specifically, the forecast is about the number of transistors that will be packed onto each chip when the cost per transistor is lowest. Moore knew that this projection had major implications, stating that integrated circuits will lead to such wonders as home computers and much more besides. In a 1975 article, he produced a new forecast for the next decade based on a careful analysis of the factors driving progress, and forecast that rather than doubling every year, there would be a doubling every two years for the next decade. Was he right? If we focus solely on transistor count, then yes and for far more than a decade. Here we plot the year in which the microchip was introduced on the x-axis, spanning the five decades from 1970 up to 2020, and transistor count on the y-axis, going from 1000 up to 50 billion. The names of individual points on the graph, which correspond to specific microchips, are not particularly critical. What matters is that we continue to see a silky smooth log linear plot. This is in my opinion, one of the most significant technological trends in the history of Homo sapiens. However, this graph just shows transistor counts. Moore's law also relates to cost, and as the technology became more intricate, at a certain point, estimated by some analysts to be around 2010, the cost decline per transistor began to slow, and in some cases, costs began increasing. Increasing costs have led NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang to assert that Moore's law is dead. Somewhat confusingly, Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger has responded to this claim with, no it isn't. Depending on how you measure costs and how you choose to interpret Moore's law, it is either pushing up the daisies or just hitting its stride. Another key trend was noted in 1974, when Robert Denard and co-authors observed that as transistors continue to shrink, power density remains approximately constant. Denard was prolific. He also won the Kyoto Prize for having invented DRAM eight years before introducing his scaling model. In Denard's model of MOSFET, or Metal Oxide Semiconductor Field Effect Transistor, scaling, with each generation, the transistor shrinks along each dimension by 30%. This reduces the device area by 50% because the area of the device is its length times its width. Its capacitance shrinks by 30% because capacitance scales with the area over the distance. Due to the shrinking, voltage can be reduced by 30% in order to keep the same electric field, which is proportional to voltage over distance. The circuit delay also reduces by approximately 30% due to the reduced gate delays at the new configurations. Then frequency is increased by 40% since the time period is reduced. These combine such that active power reduces by 50% thanks to its relationship to capacitance, voltage and frequency. All of the above blend serendipitously so that each generation, the number of transistors on a given chip doubles, the power density stays the same, and the chip runs 40% faster. Glorious. Denard scaling was a wonderful thing, but like many wonderful things, it had to end. Here is a chart of microprocessor trends, with the year plotted on the x-axis from 1970 up to 2020. Climbing fastest, we have the onwards march of transistor counts. They look healthy. However, the green points indicate microprocessor frequencies in megahertz. For years, Denard scaling had delivered massive speed gains, 
But around 2005, this came to an end, and it became impractical to keep increasing microprocessor clock frequencies. There are several reasons for this, but a key component is that Denard's scaling model ignored leakage current, since it had a negligible effect in the early transistor designs. Denard and his co-authors were aware of this. They were clever folks. Their paper foresaw that this was one of several limitations of their scaling model, which meant that naive scaling had to end at some point. Ultimately, as everything got smaller, this effect became a key factor in determining the power density of microprocessors. In particular, power density could no longer stay constant as transistors were scaled down on a chip of fixed size. Microprocessor power, which had been gradually increasing, flattened as it became difficult to cool microprocessors and prevent hotspots in a cost-effective way. We entered a new regime in which single-thread performance on standardised benchmarks like Specint still improved, but much more slowly than it had done before 2005. To overcome this hurdle, the microchip industry has turned to a different line of attack. Rather than increase frequencies, they have instead increased the number of logical cores per microprocessor, which turns out to be more power efficient and helps to keep the temperature under control. Multicore to the rescue. Perhaps now, we can simply run everything in parallel. But does this solve all of our issues and keep the performance scaling gravy train in motion? It looks like we are off to the races with multi-core processors. But now we run into a new issue, widely known as Amdar's Law, sometimes referred to by computer architects such as Hennessy and Patterson as Amdar's Heartbreaking Law. This law tells us how far we can get with parallel computation. The starting point is to note that many programs contain code that cannot be parallelized. Let's suppose that we have a program where we'll use blocks to denote units of work and where time runs from left to right. Yellow blocks must be executed serially, while turquoise blocks can be parallelized. We'll use the notation that P denotes the number of processors and T denotes the time taken. When we have one processor, the time taken is 8, since everything is run serially. With two processors, we must still run all the serial code on one processor, but we can split the parallelizable code across two processors. Our total time is 6. Similarly, with four processors, we still have to run the serial code on one processor, but we can split the parallelizable code four ways. Our total time is 5. Oh dear. This doesn't seem great, and it isn't. We are deep into diminishing returns territory. This tragedy is what Amdahl's law captures. Let alpha be the fraction of code that can be parallelized. Then, the best time we can achieve by running on P processors is the original time multiplied by 1 minus alpha plus alpha over P. In our example, we had P equals 4, the original time was 8, and alpha is 0.5 because half our code could be run in parallel. We can feed these numbers in to get that the accelerated time is t nu equals 8 times 0.5 plus 0.125, which is 5, agreeing with our visualization. In fact, this is a best case scenario because Amdahl's law gives an upper bound that is often loose. We typically have other constraints between parallel components that mean we will get even less of a speed up than this. It's all looking rather bleak. What can save us? Another law. This time, it's Gustafsson's law to the rescue. There is a key idea that underpins the interpretation of Amdahl's law. That idea is that the problem size will stay fixed even as more processors become available. However, as noted by John Gustafsson in 1988, this is virtually never the case. What happens in practice is that the problem scales with the number of processors. In general, given more processing, the problem expands to use it. It may be better to assume that runtime and not problem size is constant. This perspective links to the classic idea of Parkinson's law, in which Cyril Parkinson dryly noted in 1955 that work tends to expand so as to fill the time available for its completion, a view he came to hold after years of working in the British civil service. A major part of Gustafsson's law is the observation that it is often the parallel part of the program that scales with problem size. As a result, the speed up with P processors is better modelled by 1 plus alpha times P minus 1, a linear scaling law as a function of P. A key difference to Amdahl's law is that we assume the practitioner will be able to scale up the parallel part of the problem. In general, though Amdahl's law is technically always true, 
Which law is a better fit for observed behavior depends on the domain. Booting the operating system on your personal computer is a case when Amdahl's law makes it difficult to speed things up. In machine learning, on the other hand, we now see teams training on thousands of GPUs and achieving near linear speed ups, making the problem bigger in a way that closely matches Gustafsson's law. In fact, even in the case of booting your operating system, Gustafsson's law suggests that the boot time may stay fixed, but you will ultimately make use of all available processors to boot a stronger, more capable machine. We saw earlier that since the end of Denard scaling, multi-core computers have been on the rise. A major design choice for computers that contain multiple cores in a processor, or multiple multiprocessors, each with multiple cores, is how to organize memory. There are, broadly speaking, two strategies. The first is shared memory. Here, the key idea is that each core can directly access any location in a shared address space. This is typically the model employed on hardware like phones and laptops, at least for now. Shared memory can be thought of as hard to build, easy to program. An alternative is distributed memory. Here, each core sends a message over a network to access memory belonging to another core. We no longer have a shared address space. This is typically employed on hardware like compute clusters. In contrast to shared memory, it is typically easy to build, but hard to program. There are multiple variants of shared memory. One approach is known as symmetric multiprocessing, or SMP. Here, the key idea is that all processors have uniform access time to all memory. This system is sometimes referred to as uniform memory access, or UMA. It can be achieved by arranging multiple processors, each of which typically has a private cache, such that they all have access to a shared cache and they all share main memory, which connects to the I.O. system. A second variant is known as distributed shared memory. Here, the access time depends on the location of the data, and for this reason these systems are often referred to as non-uniform memory access, or NUMA. This time, our processors communicate through an interconnection network. The memory address space is still shared, but the physical memory and I.O. systems are located close to each processor. The speed of access depends heavily on whether the data is in the nearby memory or requires a trip over the interconnection network. How these systems are built in practice involves fascinating engineering challenges, many related to the difficulty of keeping the data in different caches consistent. However, we won't go down that rabbit hole here. We'll next turn to different parallel programming paradigms. One paradigm is referred to as data level parallelism. In this setting, we distribute data across processors, which perform the same task on different subsets of the data in parallel. A second paradigm is known as task level parallelism. Here, we distribute tasks across processors. In this setting, different tasks may be run on the same data as well as across different subsets of the data. You can see that task-level parallelism is more general than data-level parallelism, but this also means that it can be significantly more complex to implement. We will focus our attention on task-level parallelism with a shared memory model. One approach to implementing task-level parallelism is to use threads, or virtual processors, that have access to a shared memory. However, this has proven difficult to program efficiently requiring a great deal of expertise and care. One reason is that scheduling tasks and performing appropriate load balancing to make good use of the processors is a challenging job. In response to these difficulties, various task parallel platforms have emerged. These add a layer of abstraction on top of operating system threads. The programmer specifies which tasks can run in parallel, but does not bear responsibility for deciding on which core they will run. The platform itself takes care of managing the scheduling and load balancing. In 1963, Mel Conway proposed the fork join model for parallelism, an idea that is supported by task parallel platforms such as Silk, 1TBB, and OpenMP. In particular, these platforms enable two constructs. First, spawn, which forks, i.e. executes, a function, while the calling thread continues to run in parallel without waiting for the result. Second, sync, which joins, i.e. waits, for spawned threads to finish before proceeding. A key concept for this paradigm, proposed by Conway, is that the programmer only specifies which tasks can run in parallel, not which tasks must run in parallel. In this paradigm, Parallel sections of code can fork recursively until reaching a given task granularity. 
To give some intuition for this idea, suppose we have five tasks we want to execute. A, B and C can be done in parallel, and D and E can be done in parallel. During serial execution, we have a main thread that simply processes these from left to right, taking five units of time. In the fork join model, our main thread spawns two extra threads to tackle tasks A and B, while it continues with task C. When it has completed, it calls sync to create a join event, where it waits until the other threads have completed. This process repeats with another fork and another join, such that the total execution time can be as low as two units. Let's see how this framework can be used on an example. We'll look at a recursive implementation of the Fibonacci sequence value at position n. If n is less than two, we return n. Otherwise, we assign x to the Fibonacci value of n minus one, assign y to the Fibonacci value of n minus two, and then return their sum. This is, of course, not a very efficient function because we are not using memoization to avoid duplicated work. The runtime is given by t of n equals t of n minus one plus t of n minus two plus big theta of one. This can be solved via induction to give that t of n is big theta of one plus the square root of five over two to the n. This is an exponential runtime. Why is it so bad? If we look at the invocation tree starting from calling fib4, we see that it calls fib3 and fib2. The former calls fib2 and in turn fib1 and fib0. Fib3 also calls fib1. Fib2 also calls fib1 and fib0. Madness. Although it is inefficient, this function is a natural candidate for parallelization because each subtree executes independently. For example, the fib3 subtree on the left and the fib2 subtree on the right can be computed fully independently of one another. Let's look at how this can be parallelized with CLRS-like pseudocode written in the style of the Silk framework. We define the parfib function, which, if n is less than 2, returns n. This time, we place a spawn keyword in front of our call to parfib of n-1, which allows the main thread to continue on to compute parfib of n-2. Then, a sync keyword forces a join before the result is returned. Here, the spawn says that the main thread can execute in parallel with the spawned child, not that it must. The sync says that the parent must wait for all spawned children to finish. These spawn and sync keywords express the logical parallelism of the tasks. However, it is the responsibility of the scheduler to actually assign the tasks to processors. Python is famously not particularly amenable to parallelization with multithreading due to its use of the GIL or global interpreter lock, at least in CPython. However, we can implement the pseudocode by starting just as before, then using a thread pool executor to spawn a thread for parfib of n minus one. We compute the result of parfib of n minus two in the main thread, then use result to trigger a sync before returning the sum of x and y. This can achieve a major speed up over the serial Python code when using the no gil CPython implementation and some coarsening tricks that I've omitted here for clarity but can be found in the code linked in the video description. To analyze our parallel program, we can view execution as a computation directed acyclic graph or parallel trace G equals V E. Here, the executed instructions form the vertices in V and the dependencies between instructions are the edges in E. In practice, to avoid cluttered diagrams, we group chains of instructions with no parallel or procedural control statements into strand nodes, rather than representing every individual instruction as a node. When we call parfib of four, we execute the first strand of instructions, highlighted here in pink. Then, we spawn a function call to parfib of three, potentially in parallel, the main thread executes the green strand and makes a call to parfib of two. Each of these threads spawns a call to parfib of n minus one and continues to the green strand before calling parfib of n minus two. At this point, some of the recursion has bottomed out and the return of fib one and fib zero allow us to pass the sync statement and proceed to the execution of the yellow strand, which sums the results. Again, potentially in parallel, the other logic continues to execute. From here, the recursion continues to its completion, with results flowing back up the computation DAG to return to parfib of four. We'll now look at analyzing parallel computation. This requires some assumptions. First, 
we'll assume that we have an ideal parallel computer consisting of multiple processors and sequentially consistent memory. The term sequentially consistent memory, introduced by Leslie Lamport in 1979, is a technical term that means in effect that the instruction execution order will faithfully preserve the partial ordering of the DAG. This is a property that can be attained by having sequential processors coupled with first in, first out memory units. We talk about memory because we'll assume that the processors communicate by reading and writing from shared memory. The second assumption is that the processors have equal computing power. The third assumption is that there is no overhead for scheduling. With our assumptions in place, we can now turn to a theoretical work span analysis. We'll let TP denote the runtime of a program on PE processors. Then we define the work T1 as the time to execute a program on one processor and the span T infinity as the time to execute the program on an infinite number of processors. The span of a program is equal to the sum of the runtimes of the strands on the critical path, the longest path in the computation DAG. For example, for the par-fib computation graph we saw earlier, assuming each strand takes one unit of time, the work is simply the number of strands, which is 17. We find the span by first finding the longest path in the DAG, then by counting the number of strands on this path, which here is 8. These terms immediately suggest some constraints on how fast a program can run. The first, known as the work law, says that the runtime on P processors, TP, must be at least as great as the work divided by P. That's simply because P processors can do at most P units of work per time step. The span law states that an ideal parallel machine with P processors cannot be faster than one with infinite processors. We can see this by noting that the infinite processor machine could simply emulate the P processors with P of its infinite processors, leaving the rest idle. We define the speed up on P processors to be the ratio T1 over TP. By rearranging the work law, we have that this is less than or equal to P. That is to say, the maximum speed up that we can obtain in our theoretical model is at most P. We say that a computation has linear speed up if T1 over TP is big theta of P and perfect linear speed up if T1 over TP equals P. In this theoretical model, superlinear speed up is not possible thanks to the work law, but it is possible in other models. Finally, we define the parallelism of a computation as T1 over T infinity. This is the maximum possible speed up with any number of processors. Returning to our parallel Fibonacci computation, the parallelism is 17 over 8, or 2.125. We can never get more speed up than this, regardless of how many processors we add. Note that 2.125 is specific to the scenario of the computation for n equals 4. This is useful but it would be more useful if we could work out the parallelism as n grows. We'll look at how we can do this next. To analyze parallel computation in the general case, we need a way to compute the cost of composing multiple strands in the computation DAG. We have two cases to consider. The first is when strands of work, x and y, occur serially one after the other. Here, the total work is simply the sum of the work of x and the work of y. Similarly, because they run serially, the span is also the sum of the individual spans. Extra processors won't speed things up. In the second case, the strands run in parallel. As before, the work is simply the sum of the work of x and the work of y. However, the span is now the maximum of the individual spans. Whichever of x and y takes longer will be what holds up the parallel computation. We now have everything we need to analyze the Fibonacci recursion. We saw earlier that the work t1 of n for par fib of n is exponential. We can now determine the span t infinity of n for par fib of n by using the rule above together with the recursion formula from the serial case. This tells us that the span t infinity of n is the maximum of the span for n minus 1 and the span for n minus 2 plus big theta of 1, which is equal to the span for n minus 1 plus big theta of 1. This expression can be solved to tell us that the span is big theta of n. Finally, the parallelism of par fib of n is t1 of n over t infinity of n, which is big theta of an exponential term over n. This is an expression that grows very fast with n. So our recursion has lots of parallelism when n gets big, and we will get a significant speed up by adding more processors. In the video description, 
You can find links to Python code to implement parallel Fibonacci recursion, slides, and references. I hope you have a wonderful day.